Good morning, everybody. So I wanted to give this a, a Greek feel. So the ESUR logo is a small one. Um, and that's my Twitter handle. So I'm going to talk to you about a locally advanced prostate cancer. Uh, these are my disclosures. So what is locally advanced prostate cancer and why, why do we worry about it? Well, there's only one way of defining locally advanced prostate cancer, and that's on the bottom on the left. And the EAU is very specific about this entity. So it's T3 or T4 cancer. In other words, disease that had gone outside the prostate gland or involves rectum or bladder with pelvic lymph nodes, but no metastatic disease on conventional imaging. So this is a very specific disease ent entity. And it occurs in about 10 to 30% of patients presenting in high income countries. But if you were from Brazil or Africa or Indonesia, then it is really much higher. It is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70%. So it's a very important disease entity that you have to realize, and it contributes in large part to the mortality of prostate cancer. So that's why it's an interesting thing to talk about. So let me introduce you to Alexi. Alexi has a PSA of 23, digital rectal examination T3, no, uh, no metastatic disease on a bone scan and a CT scan, but has a lymph node in the left pelvic side wall. So let's just do a poll, and I'll just do this by raising of your hands. In somebody like this who has got clinically locally advanced prostate cancer, how many of you would do a PSMA PET CT? So just raise your hands. Okay. How many of you would not do a PSMA PET? You see, that's a very disappointing result because if you were clinicians, all of you would say no. None of you would say yes. And then the question is, why? Why is there a dissociation between a radiologist and what a clinician says? And, and this is important. So this is Alexi, okay? So you can see he's got a locally advanced prostate cancer, he's got a pelvic side wall lymph node, and he has no metastatic disease. And my report, my report said, the patient would be suitable for pelvic radiotherapy slash ADT, and a limited duration of ADT abiratra. That was the final sentence of my report, right? So why did I say that? I said that because there are two pieces of level one evidence that you should all know. And these are based on bone scans and CT scans. So if you look at survival rates of patients with less than three metastatic deposits on a bone scan and a CT scan, there is predictive data of benefit for survival. If you have four or more bone metastases on a bone scan and a CT scan, there is no value to radical prostate radiotherapy. Level one evidence saying that if you have zero metastases or up to four on a bone scan or a CT scan, that is the indication, right? Plus, level one evidence showing the use of adjuvant ADT abiraterone for people with M0 disease on a bone scan and a CT scan. So all clinical decisions are made on a bone scan and CT scans, not on a PSMA. Yet all of you are recommending PSMA. And this is the reason why the ESMO guidelines are very clear. They say do bone scans and CT scans. And they say do not deny patients with locally advanced prostate cancer radiotherapy just because you showed metastatic disease on a next generation imaging technique, right? So, this is a real issue. So when should you use bone scans and CT, well, PSMA PET? Actually, if there is polymetastatic disease, there is no compelling reason. There is no compelling reason. No good reason to waste money. But if the PSMA, if, if the CT scan is negative 
then there may be some role. Maybe. But the data is certainly not strong. Who would benefit from a PSMA PET? It turns out it's the bad cancers, right? Not surprising. High Gleason score and high tumor volume. These people we know benefit from a PSMA PET CT. Somebody like this, OK? This man has a two carcinomas, one at the apex and one at the base. And you can see the lesion at the apex is PSMA positive. But the lesion at the base is PSMA negative. So same patient, same Gleason score, different expressions of PSMA. Now, what about this lymph node? This lymph node is positive on an MRI, but is negative on a PSMA. Right? Interesting. But it's positive. So what is the false negative rate for PSMA? 5 to 10%. So now you find out one of the problems with PSMA PET. It's 5 to 10% can be negative. Be very careful. And in histological studies, histological studies, you can see the sensitivity of PSMA PET is 50%. It's like flipping a coin. But the specificity is fabulous, 90%. So you can, if you see something, you believe it. If you don't see something, do not believe it. Be very careful of the interpretation of a PSMA PET CT. So the question is, do these little lymph nodes that Patrick was showing you this morning are they important, right? What data is there? Well, it turns out there is very good data to show that if you were to de-escalate your therapies, right, so treat only the, so let's say you had a, PS, a patient with locally advanced disease, but the PSMA PET is negative. If you only did prostate radiotherapy, and you didn't prophylactically treat the lymph nodes, these patients would fail. And you can see, that means that microscopic lymph nodes that you are not seeing are causing relapse in the longer term. So these lymph nodes are important. Number two, you can use PSMA PET if the bone scan is equivocal. And we get lots of these patients. So here's a locally advanced prostate cancer patient. You can see the patient. This is a, this is a uh, 4 plus 5 cancer. And here is the bone scan. And here is the CT scan. Right. Now, does he have bone metastases? It's not confirmed. Right? OK. Is this less than three bone metastases? Who knows? Right? But the important thing is, should he have pelvic radiotherapy? The answer is probably yes, yeah, from that level one evidence that I showed you. But the question, real question is, should he have a limited or an extended duration of abiraterone plus ADT? That is the key question. If it was N0 or less than three bone mets, then it should be less than two years. Otherwise, it's more than 10 years. OK. Should he have metastasis-directed therapies to lesions you can't even see? Or should you do a PSMA PET CT? Right? So all of us would say, let's do a PSMA PET CT. OK. And you know what? He has multiple bone metastases. OK? Right? You can see he has about 12, 10, 12 lesions. OK. And you can see there are positive on the whole body MRI as well as the PSMA pen. OK. Now, so we now know what is going on. But do we have clarity on management? And the answer is, should we treat his pelvis with radical radiotherapy? The answer to that is yes, because I've already shown you level one evidence that he should. Number two, what should be the duration of the ADT? and abiraterone, right? 
This is interesting, because formerly it will be less than two years. Now you've shown microscopic polymetastatic disease. Is it a lifetime? Do you know? No. You have no clue. And is chemotherapy a valid option for microscopic polymetastatic disease? No. So by you guys just voting, right, for a next generation imaging technology, all you did was create controversy and confusion, right? That's all you have done for your clinicians. And that is, speaks to the other problem, is you have caused biases. Biases. Right. Now, we know that our techniques are fabulous, right? We know they're great. Higher sensitivity, high specificity, blah, 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 OK? But we are causing confusion because of biases. Stage migration bias, lead time bias, and length time bias. Now, let's say you were looking at a bunch of patients using conventional imaging, bone scans, CT scans. Remember, you would classify patients as being metastatic and non-metastatic. And you can see what the survivals would be if you used a particular treatment, OK? Now, when you do your next generation imaging technology, look what you do, right? You improve sensitivity and specificity. Right? So a patient with microscopic metastatic disease becomes metastatic. Right? A person with indolent cancer also becomes metastatic. So you have taken a cancer that would never kill a patient, and you said this is metastatic. That's a problem. But on the other hand, a person who was non uh, false positive has been shifted in the opposite direction. So you've got bi-directional shifts, right? And if you use the same treatment, both groups survive better. Both groups, not just one group, both groups. Because you've got a dilution effect. So you can see the metastatic group has been diluted, the non-metastatic group has been diluted. Also, what did you do? You diagnosed a deadly disease earlier you didn't change the treatment, but the patient died at the same time. All you did was increase length time, sorry, lead time bias. And by diagnosing all these patients with indolent cancers, what you've done is lead time bias. So ev everything you have done is controversial, right? Just causing confusion amongst your clinicians. So be very careful. Now, of course, the, 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 what we say to our clinicians is, that's because you are not taking into account the new information that we have given you. You're still using the same treatment, but we are giving you superior information, and that is true. But if they don't have a treatment that can take advantage of your technology, that's an issue. Remember, stage migration bias is just a statistical aberration. Only the perception has changed, not the disease itself. Only the perception has changed. But what you have to remember is the net benefit is important. And also you can say to your clinicians, as far as the Federal Drug Administration or the EMAA is concerned, I only have to show you that I am more accurate. I don't have to show you a management change, right? That is true. That is true. But if I make a claim, and you saw Patrick make a claim, which he did not substantiate this morning, that better detection will result in better survival, then you have to do a different series of experiments. And have we done those experiments? The answer is no. We have not done those experiments, OK? Sorry, Patrick, I didn't realize you were the chair today. <laughs> So we have to show outcomes, right? We have to show outcomes, OK? And that's what our clinicians are saying. These are, look, one, two, three, four, five papers in the last two years in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, right, and in European Urology. And these people are saying, hang on a minute, boys. All you are doing is causing confusion. What we want the people who are going to pay you for your new technique, what they want is 
that you maximize treatment benefits, you minimize toxicities, right? You avoid side effects, and you temper costs. And all you are doing is causing confusion and adding costs, right? This is, this is what they are saying to you. So we have, but we say we can change management, right? Look, they say we change management with PSMA in 28% of patients compared to bone scans and CT scans in 15%. So we are better, okay? Hang on a minute. How do you know that by changing management, you improve survival? And if you look at the literature, it's very interesting. If you look at the literature says, that, well, the clinical literature says that we should be escalating therapies on the basis of a positive MRI, right? Whereas what we are doing in practice is de-escalating therapies on the basis of a positive MRI. Hang on a minute, right? The literature is saying escalate the therapies because of a positive MRI. But what are we doing? We are de-escalating therapies. You know, we are doing metastasis-directed therapies rather than chemotherapy, for example. That's de-escalation. So what is the net benefit? Does anybody know? Nobody knows. This is the problem. There are a number of studies looking at this question. So don't make your claims too high, because all you do is create controversy. So, so what are the roles of next generation imaging in bone scan, CT scan, M0 patients in high-risk localized and high-risk locally advanced, right? So what I would say to you is, right, use it to escalate therapies. So if you thought that you were gonna do, say you were gonna do prostate-only radiotherapy and you saw a lymph node escalate, because there is good evidence for that, clinical outcomes evidence, right? Don't use it to de-escalate. So if you were going to do, for example, prostate and pelvic lymph nodes and the PSMA was negative, don't de-escalate. You de-escalate, you put that patient at a disadvantage. So there is good evidence for escalation. There is not good evidence for de-escalation in these clinical circumstances. In biochemical recurrence, it's different. In locally advanced prostate cancer and high-risk prostate cancer, it's different, right? So you need to be aware of this. Remember that because of the high specificity, you should believe the PSA, PSMA, because PSMA, the specificity is very high, right? So in people who are M0, yeah, you can then think about using limited durations of, of, okay, if you think, if PSMA shows you more cancer than you were expecting, right? And you were planning to do just a limited duration of PSMA, uh, of uh, adjuvant ADT, then you should think about a longer or even a lifetime of um, ADT because the specificity is high. Okay, so we have not yet shown management or survival impacts. In other words, a negative risk to benefit ratio. We just have not shown it. We will, in the next three to five years, we will begin to see this. And therefore, you guys need to participate in clinical trials where we escalate and we de-escalate the use of treatments depending on the PSA but depends on the clinical state of the patient. In locally advanced and high-risk prostate cancer, I would counsel against de-escalation. I would say you should treat to escalate therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Padani. Uh, we will skip the, the questions and uh,